All right, let's dig right in here, Proverbs 6. There's a lot of content in this chapter, and as we continue on through the book of Proverbs, we're going to be finding that to be the case. There's going to be a lot of truths, a lot of things that are going to be just verse after verse. could be entire sermons, but um, we're, we're starting to, to get towards that right now. There's a few real main concepts that we're going we're gonna to approach tonight. So let's get started here in verse number one. We're going to reread. We read the whole chapter. We're going to reread verses one through five. Again, this is the first kind of point or main section that we're going to deal with. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself, when thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So these all, these all five verses here go together. And what it's talking about here, it says in verse number one, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. People say, well, what does that mean? Well, when you strike, or you strike hands, you're, you know, basically it's like a handshake. And what it is, is you're making an agreement. And what this agreement is for, essentially, is that it says when you make yourself surety for your friend, you are backing financially your friend in some type of transaction, some type of loan agreement or whatever. You are saying, I'm going to be a responsible party for that. You're saying yes, and, and you know the striking of hands is like making that agreement. It's like making a handshake saying, yes, I am responsible. You come after me if he doesn't pay his debt. You're making surety for a friend. Maybe you have a friend, they're real down and out, and they don't have anything. And when you don't have anything, no one's going to lend you any money. Because they're going to be like, well, how are you going to pay me back? Right? You got nothing for collateral. You got no, like, I don't trust. I think you're just going to waste my money, and then I'll be out of money. It's, you know, it's a bad investment to lend money into someone. If you're thinking about it in terms of investments, right? If you just think about it as opposed to, you know, giving charity to someone, obviously. But if you give someone, lend money to someone, you expect to get it back, you don't want to give it to someone who you think is high risk. So what this is referring to is that say, okay, someone has a friend. And they say, all right, all right, I'll help you out. I'll back you. It's like when kids want to get a car, right? And they don't have any credit. They have no reason to do it. And their parents will be surety for them and they'll sign off on the on the agreement on the loan or whatever in order to purchase that vehicle it's the same type of thing but see what the bible is telling you to do is saying avoid that don't do that it's actually not a wise thing at all to make yourself surety and to go into debt like that and just striking hands especially when it comes down to someone else when you are making yourself surety for them. Look what it says. It says, thou art snared, in verse number two, a snare is a trap. It says, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. The Bible's talking that, talk, t saying that that's a trap that you get into and warning us to avoid that. Don't do that. It says, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. So he's saying, you know what? You need to just make sure that this debt gets cleared. You need to make sure that you are not under this type of you know, potential bondage and that you just make sure that this, this debt gets paid off. So, you know, again, and the Bible teaches that we're not supposed to be, you know, these deadbeats. So that when you, because what it is, is you're, make, you're using your word and making a promise that says, I will make sure that that debt gets paid. And as Christians, you know, the world out there, especially with the whole housing crisis, right? I mean, this was, this was news not that long ago. 2008 was, was like the peak of that bubble, right? 2007, 2008, and then everything went crashing down, and a lot of people lost their homes. And what some people were doing was saying, well, I'm going to take advantage of this. Because they knew that since so many people were getting their credit ruined, that if they just let their house get foreclosed on, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. And they look at it and say, well, I don't have that much invested in this. The bank is really who's going to suffer because the property value dropped so low. You know, I got, you bought it when it's really, really expensive. Then you just say, I know, I know some people that just, well, just walk away. They, they had the means to pay for it. They had the means to meet their obligation. At first, you know, in 2007 or 2008 or whatever year it was when they had that house, 
and things were going great and they thought, man, this is awesome. I got this house. They made an agreement on how much they were going to pay. They said, this is the deal. They, they shook hands on it or whatever, you know, they signed their name and said, that's what I'm going to agree to. And then later on down the road, oh, well, this turned out to be a bad investment because now all of a sudden my house isn't even worth that much. I don't want to pay that anymore. And people just turned their back and they left and they made the exasperated the problem even worse than it was because so many people were doing that because they said it just didn't make financial sense to do that. And I believe that that's right. If you're a Christian, that's wrong. I mean, if you're anybody, that's wrong. You make an agreement and you're able to, to, to meet the, 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 you know, your part of the bargain, then you meet your part of the bargain. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, some people honestly lost some work, lost some hours. They were unable to continue to, to pay what that is. And, you know, obviously leases have stipulations for things like that. And uh, you, you negotiate and deal with that. I had that problem. When I bought my house, when I wasn't married, and I was just working tons of overtime, and then I got married and had kids and, you know, like, turned into a different financial situation. But, see, I worked with them, and I made sure every month, all the way up until I possibly couldn't do it anymore, they got their money. And I was doing everything I possibly could, drain my savings, drain everything I could, just to make sure that I am going to make good on my debt and do what I said I was going to do. And I believe that that's what a Christian ought to do. And the Bible's saying here that if you get yourself involved in that in an agreement, you strike hands with someone and you say, okay, I'm going to be surety for this person or even for yourself, you make sure that that debt gets paid. You be diligent about that. As it says in verse 4, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. He's saying if you have to, don't, you know, don't rest. Don't let this thing go. Don't just put it off. He says, you be diligent about it and pay it off. Verse number five, deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of a hunter and as a bird from the hand of the follower. He's saying it's, it's, a, it's like you're being hunted when you have this surety hanging over your head. So he's saying, do whatever you can. Work hard. Don't sleep. Get this knocked out and take care of it. Uh, turn, if you go to Proverbs 17, we'll see uh, a few more verses that talk about this uh, being a surety or striking of hands is what the, the, the first part here we're looking at. Proverbs 17. S Proverbs 17, verse number 18. The Bible reads, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. So he's saying there, you don't have any understanding if you are going to put your neck on the line for them to get a loan. And then in Proverbs 22, flip your foot to Proverbs chapter 22, just a few more pages to the right. Proverbs 22 and verse number 26. The book of wisdom is, is explaining to us here in verse 26, Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? Getting into debt is not a good idea. Now, this is not mentioning at all, and I mentioned it briefly, you know, charity. If you have a friend or a brother in Christ that's in need, what you ought to be able to do is lend to them and hoping not to receive again. You know, I've lent to brothers in Christ before, but I always lend them what I'm willing to just part with because, hey, as far as I'm concerned, they can keep it. If they want to pay me back, great. You know, that's fine. If I can help them out, amen and amen. But I'm not going to, um, you know, first of all, I'm not going to let money come between me and a brother in Christ. So if they can't pay back, I'm not even going to make that agreement and say, okay, well, fine. And I don't want them to be put in this situation of now having to be surety. So it's just, here you go. Take that. And I believe that's a Christian thing that we ought to be doing to help out other brothers. But um, for you, for yourself, he's saying, look, if you don't have anything to pay, why, why would you even let them then take your bed away from you? If you got nothing, you know, don't just go out and borrow money because you have nothing to pay it back with. You have no reason. And one other topic that I want to kind of cover here, turn if you would to Leviticus 25. Because this goes hand in hand with this subject of getting into debt or being surety for someone else to get into debt, right? Being the responsible person of a debt. The other aspect of debt and lending is usury. 
And God is very serious about usury and condemns usury. See, we live in a world today where it's commonplace. And to be honest with you, I never even heard about it or knew what it was until I started going to Faithful Word Baptist Church and so I started reading the Bible on my own. Because this is something that is foreign to me. It's just the way things are. What, and if you, in case you don't know what usury is, it's interest. It's making money on interest. So if, you know, the banks do this all the time. I mean, that's how they make, one of the ways they make money. And if you want to borrow money from the bank, they're going to say, okay, but you're going to pay me every month, you know, 3%, 4%, 7%, 20%, whatever, you know, whatever their, their interest rate happens to be. Credit cards are usually much higher. House loans, 3%, 4%, whatever the case may be. But that's called usury. And the Bible teaches, we'll see this here, the Bible teaches that among, among brethren, among God's people, it should, it's not allowed at all. He's saying the only people that, that the children of Israel were allowed to, to charge usury on was the heathen. They were allowed to charge usury to the heathen, to the foreigners, to the foreign country. That was acceptable, but not among your people, not among God's people. And no Christian, if you have someone that's in debt, if you have someone that's in need, and you want to lend them money, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but you better not be charging them interest. Don't you be like the bank and saying, okay, I'll lend you some money, brother, but guess what? I'm going to charge you a fee and you got to pay me you know, an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever, whatever you're going to charge. That's wicked and that's sinful. Look at Leviticus 25, verse number 35. Leviticus 25, 35, the Bible reads, And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen and decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. And he reminds them there in that verse, saying, I brought you out. You were bondmen in Egypt. You were slaves. You didn't have anything. And I brought you forth out of that and blessed you and gave you this land. So you better remember that and say before you start thinking that you're going to be charging usury on your brother that's down and out and poor and having a hard time on him. Because that's another instrument of the rich to keep the poor down is this concept of usury anyways. When you need money, man, the last thing you need is just getting charged on top of the money that you already need saying, okay, well, I need 100 bucks because I can't even eat. And now you got to pay 120 back to them. I mean, you, just, you can't dig out of, that, of, of, your, of the problem situation that you're in when you have to just be given money back for no reason. And the Bible says that's wicked. I hope to never hear about anything like that happening within this church because among God's people, this is a sin. And notice it said there in verse 35, it says, look, if your brother's wax and poor, he says, thou shalt relieve him. Help him out. Help, that's your obligation. You do Help your brother out, man. Help him. Even if he's a stranger or a sojourner, if he's living there among you, though, he's like, help him out. And whatever you lend him, don't you take any usury on it. Don't, don't get any more back than what you gave him. So first we need to make sure and a wise person is not going to be getting into debt to begin with. I don't, I don't believe in debt. This church will never be in debt. I don't think it's something that, that we ought to be doing. Um, I understand that, that people, and myself included, I have debt. Okay, I wasn't as wise before. And now I'm paying for it. And the problem with debt is it takes a really long time to get out especially if you're not making a whole lot of money, to, to be able to, to pay all that off. And it, and it really does put you in bondage. Because now I'm forced in a position where I just have to work a bunch of extra hours just to try to get rid of that and to support my family. Like, you know, you're working extra hard to just pay for stuff that you don't even have anymore. Or was, you know, it's all gone. I mean, all that debt, you know, credit card debt, student loan debt, whatever all that debt is, it's, it's worthless. It's not doing anything for me right now, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> But it does get you in bondage. And um, it's definitely something that we need to avoid. And all of these topics here, we'll get these couple of these main topics. So turn back if you go to Proverbs 6. six. We're going to notice that they all flow together. They all, they all are related somewhat. 
Because the next section of Proverbs 6, after it's talking about being surety and getting into debt, is being a hard worker. I mean, the Bible said already not to let, don't let your eyes slumber, you know, don't, don't sleep. If you got this debt hanging around your neck, if you're surety for someone else, you better make sure of that promise, make sure of your friend, and uh, get that settled as quickly as possible. Look at verse number 6. Proverbs 6, 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Again, as a Christian, you ought to be a hard worker. So he's saying, you know, look at the ant. Go to the ant. Look at the ant's ways, sluggard. What's a sluggard? Someone who moves really slow, someone who doesn't want to work, someone who just wants to sleep and be lazy and sit on the rear end and not do any work. That's a sluggard. And it's not a good thing to be. The Bible's saying, look, look at the ant. Consider her ways and be wise. It says, look, the ant has no guide. There's no overseer. No, there's no one telling the ant what to do. But the ant provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. So saying the ant is able to take care and store up and make sure that, that it's going to have food and be fed throughout the year. And it goes and it works. And you see ants, you see how big things that they're able to carry. Like you see these huge bugs. I mean... These things are dragging up, you know, these, these real large insects and stuff and bringing them to wherever their, their home or whatever. And uh, the ants work hard. I mean, they're constantly running around on the ground and going back and forth and doing all this work. And they don't need anyone telling them what to do. They just work. And, you know, you ought to be the type of person that doesn't need a boss hanging over you telling you what to do. You ought not to be the type of person who, who works with service like as a men pleaser. The Bible says in Colossians 3, actually, let's just turn there. It's not my notes, but um, because this is how we ought to be as a worker. The Bible here is talking about, about being a hard worker. In uh, verse 22 of Colossians 3, the Bible reads, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So he's saying, look, if you're a servant, you got a boss, you work for somebody, don't work. And we all know these people that sit around and do nothing. They're playing games, maybe especially in an office job. I've seen this. You know, people just, they're playing games, they're chatting, they're doing everything other than work. And then the wa boss walks by, right? And they're like, you know, sitting up straight and they look like they're doing work. And then the boss leaves and they're back to just screwing around again and not doing anything productive. That's a men pleaser. That's, that's, that's the people who only are going to work because they just want to be seen looking like they're working hard and they're not doing it. And the Bible's teaching us, you know what? You need to work as unto Christ. Christ sees everything. You don't work only when your boss sees. You work when he doesn't see. You work even if you don't get the recognition for it. Because that's another thing that happens. Sometimes people want to come up and steal what you, you know, the work that you've done and get credit for it when you put in all the hard work, you put in all the labor. But I'll say, don't worry about that because you know what? God sees that work. God sees what you're doing and he'll bless you for it. He'll make sure that you receive a just recompense of your reward if you will simply be a hard worker. And maybe you work for a boss that you have no respect for. Maybe you work for a boss that's a total idiot. Not smart at all, just really dumb. And you say, you know what? I know way more than my boss. I, you know, I can't even listen to this guy. Yeah, but if you are a servant and they're the boss, you need to do what they say. You're in that position of authority at a job. I don't care if you know what's better. If they're telling you to do something, you humble yourself and you do it. Because that's right. You don't need to be rebellious. Now, you can go to your boss, which I'm in a position where, where I'm able to approach my boss and, and bring up ideas and bring up things. And you know, he, we have a good relationship. He's able to listen to me when I think that things are better. But at the end of the day, if we disagree on something, he's the boss. 
and I'm the servant. And even if you, now I respect my boss, I think he's an intelligent man, but even if you have someone that you have no respect for, the Bible says to work as if you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is ultimately your boss. And he's the one saying, you know what, whatever you do, do it heartily. Put your heart into it. You say, yeah, but I've got a job where I scrub toilets and I just clean the floor and stuff. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. How would you be cleaning that if you thought that Jesus Christ was going to walk into this building and he's going to use that bathroom or he's going to sit down in his place, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, it may sound like a silly example, but look, we need to work heartily and think about it in those terms and not just do a shoddy job of just whatever you do. Oh, yeah, whatever. Be, be the type of person that works hard at what you do and puts your heart into it and cares about it. Even if it isn't the best job in the world. Even if it is working at McDonald's. Hey, be the best employee. Be someone that can give a good testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone says, man, you know, there's all these employees here, but that Christian over there, he's really working hard. Here's someone that's going to represent Christ out in the world. That's being really productive. That's doing all the work. That's, that's not just blowing things off on the job. That's the type of person we need to be. Not a sluggard. What does a sluggard do? A sluggard just, he says, when without, look at this, we're, uh, go back to Proverbs 6. Verse 9. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? He's saying, you know, it's easy to get caught up in this trap. I was like this as a teenager. I know that. I mean, part of it might have been because I was growing, but part of it was because I was lazy too. You just stay, you know, you just go to sleep and just sleep until, I remember sleep until noon. I can't even imagine that anymore. Sleep until noon or one in the afternoon. I'm sleeping. It's like, how long are you going to sleep, sluggard? You're wasting the whole day. Do something. And even if you're a kid, you'll get up and do something. Don't allow yourself to fall into these habits. Even if you don't have a lot of responsibility, don't allow yourself to fall into the habits where you just become a sluggard. Be active. Be doing things. And besides, if you're a sluggard, you're going to be idle. And being idle is not a good thing. When the Bible talks about Sodom and Ezekiel, it talks about them having fullness of bread and idleness. And, and they had, you know, they were wealthy. They just had all this stuff and all this free time. And what happened? They resorted to, to perversion and filthiness. And, and we know the story there. Don't be a sluggard. It says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and that want as an armed man. The sluggard isn't going to have anything. You know, you're going to come to poverty. You're going to be poor. You say, if you can't, if you don't know how to get up and work, if you don't know how to just get your butt out of bed in the morning, you're going to be poor. Say, I know you're tired. Get up anyways. Get up and go to work. The Bible says you don't have to turn there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7, because the Apostle Paul was real big on this, on showing the, the other churches, the New Testament churches, how they ought to be. Because he, he had the right to, to receive money, to receive goods, to receive things from these churches because he was doing the work of God. I mean, he was going out, winning souls. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was doing all this work for God. He had the right to be paid for all the work that he was doing. And in some cases, he was being helped out and paid along the way. But in many cases, he was out working. He was a tent maker. He was working by night and preaching the gospel by day. And he was providing his own way. And he was showing them that this is how it's done. Don't tell me you don't have time to go out soul winning. I got time to go out and do this work for God, and I'm working a full-time job. And by the way, that's what I'm doing right now. So anyone that says, oh, I don't have time to go and do all this stuff, well, you're the pastor. Of course you need to do these things. Yeah, I'm a pastor, but I have a full-time job too. You're going to tell me, well, I've got a full-time job. I can't do this. So do I. You should at least be able to do what I'm doing. You should at least be able to put in the hours I'm putting in. If I can do it, there's no reason you can't. And this is the example the Apostle Paul was setting for these people. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible reads, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, or for nothing. He said, we didn't eat your bread for nothing. But wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. So we worked hard night and day. So that, you can't, so that we would not be chargeable. You can't uh, say that you gave us anything. Verse number 9. Not because we have not power, 
but to make ourselves an ensample for you to follow us. He's saying we, we totally could have done it, but we want to give you a good example. Verse number 10 reads, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And that is a great verse to live by and also for you to help decide who you are going to help out and who you're not. The Bible says, he says, look, when we're among you, if any man's not willing to work, if you're just a slugger, if you're not going to get up and get to work, then you're not going to eat. Because you need some type of motivation to get your rear end out of bed. And if the only thing is going to be because you're hungry, then so be it. He's saying, I'm not going to help you out if you're not willing to go to work. Now, the Bible talks about giving alms and helping people out. Sarah, don't do that. Sit in your chair. It's, it's usually referring to people that have disabilities, people that have problems, people who are widowed, you know, people who are unable to work, people who actually legitimately need help. And there's plenty of people out there that need help, and that's great. Give them alms. Give them the help that they need. But if you have a, a, an able man capable of working that is not working, then he shouldn't eat. He needs to, to figure out and, and figure out what point he gets hungry enough to decide, okay, fine, I'll get up and do something. Verse 11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Again, when you're not working, you're full of idle time. And what does that idle time lead to? Being busybodies. Getting involved in other people's business. Doing stuff that's just going to cause problems. Now, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. The Apostle Paul says, this is under the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Get to work. Be quiet and eat your own bread. Provide for yourself. And provide for your family. The Bible says that if any man provide not for his own, especially for them of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We need to have a strong work ethic. Amen. All of that, I think everything I've mentioned so far, we're talking about working even just <laughs> physically to provide for ourselves, to provide for food, provide for our family. What about all the work that God's requiring of us to go out and do for Him? Right. Preaching the gospel. I mean, that's, that's hard work in and of itself. Also, if you don't have a good work ethic, you're going to come home at the end of the day and not want to do anything else from your regular job. You're not going to want to serve God. But if you have a good work ethic, you'll be able to say, all right, I'm still going to do more. I'm going to put in more time. I'm going to, I don't need someone just overseeing me all the time, telling me what to do. I'm going to be like the ant. I'm just going to go and do stuff. I know it needs to be done. And honestly, you know, if you could have that type of an ethic and a work at, and an attitude to work and not need someone managing you, you will be blessed in your own business that you do because those are the types of people that get promoted. Those are the types of people that are going to get the best jobs because the boss will recognize that someone else who's already managing you is going to see someone, wow, this person doesn't even need to be managed. I don't need to be managing him. In fact, he'll probably be a good manager and you could move up into the next spot. Start earning more money and doing more, you know, more things, have more responsibility because they see that you're a hard worker. Let's go back to Proverbs 6. I don't know if I had you move away from there. Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to go to the next portion of Scripture here in Proverbs chapter 6. We're shifting gears a little bit now. We're going to talk about a wicked man, which we've talked about multiple times through the book of Proverbs already to this point. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 12. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Now this wicked man that we're talking about here, I'm going to go into a lot of detail on this. Verse 15 says that you know, up to this point, he's explaining how he, uh, he winks with his eyes, you know, he speaks with his feet, teaches with his fingers, real, um, when, I, when I look at this description, 
It's someone who's, who's, who's pretty cool and probably uh, relatively charismatic and being able to, to communicate with people, or get people to, to trust them. You know, this is a guy that's winking at you, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and uh, teaching with his fingers. Good, a lot of body language here. That, but um, it says forwardness is in his heart. So he's being deceptive. I think of a, a used car salesman or something. <laughs> Now, this type of wickedness, though, goes well beyond the used car salesman. The used car salesman is just trying to make a buck and they're not out trying to, to hurt you or whatever. This is the type of person, though, that deviseth mischief continually. He sows discord. And we just went over that on Sunday night, sowing discord among the brethren. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly and says, suddenly shall be broken without remedy. Without remedy means without any cure. No hope for the wicked person, he says, his destruction is going to come and there is no cure for that. And I believe this is talking about them going to hell. Just being rejected, going to hell. The wicked person that just dies and goes to hell, he's going to be broken without remedy, with no, no hope at all, no fixing that. And then in verses 16 through 19, this is what we just finished on our Sunday night series. We went through each one of these individuals. We'll read it again. Verse 16, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, if you remember, if you were here for our Sunday nights and, and going through this series, we went, pretty in, we went really in-depth on all of these various things that God hates. And it says here, they're an abomination unto Him. So these are very, very serious sins. And, as, and I don't know about you, but as we started to, to, to get into these things, we started to really see how serious these sins are and how really wicked they are. And in every instance, you were able to find the Bible talking about reprobates and people who are extremely wicked people having these attributes. And I want to call to your attention to the fact that in verse 16, well, in, in the preceding verses, verses 12 through 15, it's talking about the wicked man, the guy who's, who's you know, continually devising mischief. And then it goes into these six things that the Lord hates. Notice that it says in verse 16, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. That word abomination means extremely hated by God. It is a strong word. And when you do a word study on the word abomination, I recommend you do it and just see what things does God consider to be abominable and abomination. Well, I know one thing that comes to mind. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. I'll read for you from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Leviticus 20, 13 reads, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Homosexuality, sodomy, in God's eyes, is an abomination. And it's no coincidence here in Proverbs 6 that he says all of these things are an abomination to him. Look at Romans chapter 1 because as I was studying for this and thinking, you know, I'm going to wrap up everything that we did on the Sunday nights here, and I wasn't planning on spending very much time on this, but I think it deserves a little bit more time as a whole, as a group. We went through them individually, but now let's look at all these attributes. And I started thinking about this. I started thinking, you know what? A proud look, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Wow, this list looks really familiar to me. He calls it an abomination. We know that sodomy is an abomination. Romans chapter 1 describes the reprobate. Let's start reading in verse number 28 and see if any of these things pop out at you. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Look at verse 29. Now, this is going to give you the attributes of the reprobate. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, 
malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, that's a lot of horrible things included in that list that describes the reprobate, that describes the person that has been given up by God right. to the reprobate mind. And if you noticed, I'm going to highlight these, the six things that God hates. What's the first one? A proud look. Oh, hey, look, verse 30, proud. What's the second thing? Hands that shed innocent blood. Oh, verse 29, murder. What's the third thing? And heart that, oh wait, I missed a lying tongue was the second thing. Deceit, verse 29. The fourth thing, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Look at verse 30. Inventors of evil things. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Where is that? Hold on. Let me get. <laughs> and he that soweth discord among brethren. Remember when we did he that soweth discord, discord among brethren? I missed the boldness here. See, I have all the bold things pointed to, to pop out when I was doing this. So I missed that one. But the um, feet that, that are um, sowing discord among brethren, the whisperers and the backbiters. Do you remember that? That was the, the people who are sowing discord. They're, they're whispers. But we, we proved that on Sunday night. And then the, uh, swift and running the mischief is doing, you know, basically bad things. That's going to be the maliciousness. That's going to be filled with all unrighteousness. That's going to be people who are um, implacable and unsatisfied. Um, when we did feet that were uh, running the mischief, remember, they couldn't sleep unless they had done evil to somebody. And when you're implacable, you're not satisfied. You're not satisfied with anything. You're unmerciful. And these are all in here in this list. In Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> so it's no mistake that God calls sodomy an abomination. That in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that God has given them over to a reprobate mind. And if you look up further in Romans chapter 1. There's two other times that the Bible says that God has given them up. And this is all very timely that we're looking at this. We'll start reading in verse number 22. By professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, verse 26, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. So in th these two cases here, God's saying he gave them up and gave them over. And he gave them up to do these things. To do these things that no normal person naturally would do. Now, we all know that we have a sin nature. We were born with it. As a result of Adam's sin, we have a sinful body. We have a sinful flesh. When you tell a lie to get out of trouble, you don't have to figure that out. My kids don't have to figure out how to tell a lie. It comes naturally with their flesh. 
When a man looks on a woman and lusts after her in his heart. According to Jesus, he's committing adultery. But guess what? That also comes naturally. It's something that God has ingrained in us, that he has made us the way that we are designed. Every single human being has a sinful nature. But you know what the Bible says is not natural? Men with men doing that which is unseemly. Women with women. That is not natural. That is not the sin nature that God has given us, that we, not, not that God has given us, but that we were born with. That is not a natural sin in order to even, for people to even do that. They've been given up on. They've been given over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, to do those things that don't come naturally. Because no normal person is going to do those things inherently just based on your sin nature. And this is what people fail to understand. This is where the big problem is because so many people are upset about Pastor Jimenez and about the sermon he preached and how he was happy that, that you know, these people lost, the, the, the sodomites, the wicked reprobates that they are, lost their lives. Because it's a judgment of God. And what people fail to realize is that it's not that there's... And so, so many people get this backwards. People think that, oh, if you commit a certain sin of, of sodomy or homosexuality, that that is like an unforgivable sin. That's not what we're saying. What it is is a reflection of the fact that you've already been given over to a reprobate mind. See, the reprobation happens prior to that. Right. It's when you profess yourselves to be wise, when you know God and you glorify Him not as God, when you understand the truth, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you reject it, you don't have anything to do with that. That's when God gets to the point then where He'll reject you. And the unregenerate man, the person who's not saved, and hears about God, knows about God, but becomes vain in his own imagination, rejects God, rejects Jesus Christ, and decides to just make up his own God. That's the point here where the, where the Bible's talking about someone who's said, okay, fine, you don't want to retain me and your knowledge. You want to get away from me as far as possible. You hate my words. You hate my instruction. You don't even want to hear about me. Fine. I'm going to put you out of my mind. And I'm going to turn you over to a rejected mind to where, and like it says in Proverbs chapter 1, we saw that where people, you know, you call upon me, but I'm not going to answer. You know, they're going to, they're going to come try to come to me when, when their fear comes at these. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to mock when that happens, when that day happens. Why? Because they've been reprobate. They've been rejected. They've been given over. And this, 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 Teaching cannot be more clear than it is here in Romans chapter 1. But having this understanding that if God has given up on someone, He's rejected them, then what do you think we could do about that? Because people say, oh, you're supposed to love the sodomite. No, we're not. If God has rejected them, if God has given up on them and given them over to reprobate mind, what do you think we can do about it? We can't get anyone saved but through the power of God anyways. And if he's rejected people, I'll tell you what, you can't do anything. Amen. It is what it is. Now, the other thing that we need to understand is when you see the Bible talking about someone who's given over to do these things, which are not convenient, someone who goes after strange flesh and then describes what they're full of, I don't care who you know, I believe God's word over any personal experience you might have with a person, if the Bible says that they're filled with all unrighteousness, they're filled with fornication, they're filled with wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. I believe it. Amen. And you know what? It's evident for anybody who looks. Look at their wicked parades. Actually, don't look at them because they're full of this stuff. It is disgusting. It's, it's, it, it's reprehensible and it makes your stomach turn. Any normal person, the stuff that they do out there, why? Because they have no shame. 
Because their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They glory in their shame. That's why it says here in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, they know about God. They know what their judgment is. They've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. They know that God rained fire and brimstone out of heaven and destroyed those wicked Sodomites. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. They know they deserve the death penalty. But look, it says, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They actually derive pleasure out of it. It's something that they like to do. Not only them, they promote their whole thing. They put it on a big show. They put on a big parade and say, look at how filthy we are. We're like filthy animals up here. The Bible describes what they're really like. Satan and his agenda through mass media, through the television, through the movies, has been trying to brainwash the public into thinking that they're just like you and me. It's just a lifestyle. It's just a different choice. But they're, but they're, they're fine. There's nothing. Hey, look, let them do what they want to do. No. No. They started doing it through comedy. They introduced the faggot through TV shows of saying, oh, look at that flaming little fairy over there. Isn't he funny? And they get you to laugh at it. They make a joke out of the abomination to get you to be softened up to it. And then, when they figure they'd gone far enough with that, then they started to turn a little bit more serious. Then it turned into, oh, look at this sad sodomite story and everybody hates him to try to get you to have sympathy and to accept and to feel sorry for the wicked pervert. And then it turns into, now you're going to start accepting what we do. Because now we've gotten you to accept it. We've gotten you to allow it to even be put in front of your eyes through comedy. Now we've touched your heart by saying, oh, look at how sad and sorry this is. Now they're going to, and then they started doing, because look, I remember this progression. I'm old enough to remember it when I was watching TV and I was watching the movies. Then they started doing the acts on the screen, the actual, you know, kissing. And they do it once at first because it's a shock because that's the right reaction that any normal person would have. It's disgusting. But they do it over and over and over again to shock you out of having that guttural reaction to get you used to it. That has been the agenda to the point now to where Christians, Christians are rallying against a Baptist pastor that's saying amen for the judgment of God because these people are wicked and they're predators. The examples that the Bible gives of Sodomites are not good. Right. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah, what they do. The whole town, all of the men, young and old, surrounded the house. Why was it young and old? Because they're pedophiles. Right. Because they are predators that prey on the unstable souls. Amen. The young and the old surrounded Lot's, ho Lot's house to do wicked things under the angels that came in to sojourn with them, to, to get him out. And the same thing in Judges, with the man and his concubine that came into town, the men of Belial, the Sodomites came into town, they wanted him too. They did the exact same thing. When God repeats a story, when two things happen, and it's put in the Bible twice, there's an emphasis there saying, don't be deceived about who these people are. They may want to make you think on the outside that they're just like everybody else. There's nothing wrong with us. Have sympathy. Have compassion on us. Mourn us. Love us. But on the inside, it's wickedness, murder, debate. You know what? And it's no surprise now. It should be no surprise. I've seen reports that the, that the guy that shot up that, and I'm not going to call it a gay bar because there's nothing happy about it. That sodomite bar, the queer bar, Amen. 
The guy that shot it up now was is reported now as been a regular at, at that establishment. Right. That he's a homo himself. He's a queer himself. That's right. And is it any shock when the Bible says that they're full of murder that this guy is going out and doing these things? Just like it's no shock that Jeffrey Dahmer was a sodomite. Just like it's no shock that John Wayne Gacy was a sodomite. And all these wicked serial killers that you read about and hear about, all of them, they're given over to strange flesh. Why? Because God's given up on them because they're able to do these things that nobody would ever think about in a million years to do. Because they've been given up on. And we need to stand with the, with the men of God that are going to boldly proclaim this truth because now more than ever, the world needs to hear this. People have been brainwashed for decades to accept this perversion. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to accept it. And I don't care who, who comes to protest. I don't care what the media or the world or anybody else has to say until I lose this voice and I'm lying in the grave. I'm going to preach against this wickedness and perversion because I care about my kids and I care about your kids. Amen. I don't want any of these filthy faggots touching any of our kids. Oh, you're so full of hate. So full of hate. You're just up there yelling and screaming in a church. I can't believe you'd do that. Amen, brother. I care about you. I care about my family. And I care about the word of God and the truth. And I care about warning people about the disgusting, vile, perverted wickedness of the sodomites and their agenda that so many people don't, are ignorant of, don't even know. This is not any other sin. This is not. I know I'm a sinner and I'm not perfect. And I've heard the argument before. Look, they're just sinners. It's just like, you know. No, this is a person that's been given up on and given over to do those things. It's not natural. Any other sin is natural. This one is not. And it's the sign that shows you I mean, they might as well just have reprobate stamped on their forehead when they're a flaming homo. Right. Because that is the sign of someone who's been given over to the reprobate mind. Right. You can't always spot them. The closeted ones, the people who, you know, that put on the good show, you can't spot them. That's why it says in Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 that they're going to be among you. They're going to creep in unawares. They're going to sneak into the churches. They're going to try to attack the kids. They're going to try to split the church. They're going to try to do all these things. These are the people that come in and try to split the, the church. And they're the whisperers. They're the backbiters. They're the haters of God. Now, does it kind of make sense? Going back to Proverbs chapter 6. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Amen. These are all attributes of the reprobate. Bends on nothing but destruction. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 6. We'll finish up this chapter. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. Always be in the word of God. Keep it with you. This is a common theme we see over and over and over again in the Bible. We need the wisdom. Especially in a dark, wicked, perverted world. We need this wisdom. We need to be able to rely on this wisdom because everything you're going to hear from everyone else, it could even make you doubt what you actually believe unless you're in this book. Right. Like I said earlier, when everybody's telling you, go sit down, sweetheart, when everybody's telling you that you're wrong and, and calling you every name and under the sun and all these other things, it will make you question yourself. But don't let them sway you away from God's word. Mm -hmm. And they can't do it if it's with you. If it's when you wake up, when you go to bed, throughout the day, if God's word is with you, if you could retain it in your heart and keep it in your mind and keep it fresh, you won't be moved.
You will be unmovable and steadfast, as the Bible says. You'll, you'll be solid. You'll be standing on that solid rock and they won't be able to shake you. But don't let it slip. Don't become complacent. Don't be the sluggard when it comes to God's Word and being in it. You can be a hard worker out in the field, but don't become a sluggard in God's Word. You need that more than you need the other. Keep up with it. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23. This is the last main point here, the last main topic that's covered. It's going to talk about adultery here. Verse number 23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman... A man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Remember, I think it was last week we were talking about the strange woman. The whole sermon was about that. And this is the verse that I referenced last week. She's going to hunt for the precious life. These people are out there. The adulterous woman is hunting for the precious life. He's saying, don't, you know, don't lust after her beauty. Just because she has this outward appearance of being real beautiful, don't let that get to you. Don't let her take, take you with her eyelids. She's you know, blinking her eyes at you and flirting with you. Don't get, don't get caught by that trap. Verse number 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise the thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though thou givest him many gifts." And this is saying here, it brings up a thief, right? Another sin, stealing from somebody. Hey, if you're down and out and you're poor and you steal bread, people don't despise you for that. They don't look at you and just hate you because you're so poor that you went and stole bread. Now, they're going to punish you because you ought not to be stealing, right? That's a sin. It's against God's law. Don't do it. You're going to have to pay back fivefold. It's a really stupid thing to do. But people don't hate you for it. You can have some kind of understanding for the person who's hungry that steals in order to eat. You can have compassion on a person like that. You don't despise them. But the man that commits adultery with someone else's wife, there is no compassion for that. Adultery, I believe, is one of, if not the worst sin that a person can commit against someone else. The violation of the trust, the violation of that sanctity, going in onto someone else's wife, is that you have no understanding. He said, what are you thinking? You think you're going to get away with it? You think you could take fire and just carry a, a load, you know, some hot burning coals in your arms and it's not going to burn you? You think you're just going to be impervious to that? You think you can walk on the hot coals and it's not going to burn your feet? Of course it's going to burn you. He's saying... The same thing. You go in into someone else's wife, guess what? You're not innocent. And it says here that the man, you know, it says jealousy is the rage of a man. As you hear about these things, you know, these, these uh, murders of that, that um, what are they called when, when you're in a fit of rage, right? Um, passion. passion. Thank you. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Passion. Passionate murders when, when you know, a man walks in on his wife that's committing adultery on him. I don't blame him for killing a guy. I mean, look, again, here's the thing. Is it right to take the law in your own hands and murder someone else? No. I'm not saying that it is. But you understand the reaction and the justice that would be served in that case. And... It fully makes sense. And look, I, I believe this too. And see, this is, this is the flag of people. Oh, so then you believe that, you know, adulterers should be put to death. Yes, I do. 
Just as much as the, as the sodomite, the homosexual, should be put to death because the Bible says so, so should the adulterer Amen. and the adulteress. That's God's word. That's his judgment. Amen. I believe it. And it makes sense. Amen. Justice needs to be served. People need to see and hear and fear so that they don't do it. Same thing with kidnapping. Look, you, I, I preached an entire sermon on the death penalty in the Bible, and we ought to have it today. Why is it that if, if I were to say to someone, at least still in 2016, most people would probably say that a pedophile deserves the death penalty. Most people would say amen to that. He's sick, he's twisted, they ought to just put him to death. Instead of what's happening now where they get like two or three years in prison and they're back out on the streets, they say, oh, well, you have to register. Oh, you can't live near a school. As if they have to live near a school in order to go find and kidnap and defile a child. Because that's going to stop them. Oh, I'm not by a school. What kind of weird world do we live in? People get put in prison for smoking a plant way longer than they do for defiling children. But if you think that a child molester should be put to death, you ought to believe, you ought to 100% to believe that the homos should be put to death too because that's what they are. Read Romans 1 again. Those are the attributes of the sodomite. And the adulterer should also be put to death. We shouldn't be pitying the people that commit these sins. Look, I know what happens. But they reap what they sow. And if you love God and if you love His law and you love His commandments, you should agree with that too. What's real funny, I'm just going to close on this, we're done with Proverbs 6, is uh, I've had people contacting me because, you know, these, the sodomites are implacable and unmerciful. Now, I haven't really posted anything lately that's inflammatory, that's going to make people really upset, unless they actually listen all the way through my sermons, which most people don't anyways. I mean, you put up an hour-long sermon, most people don't listen to that. They hear the short clips, and those are the ones that go viral, and those are the ones that get everybody all angry and mad. But I've been getting contacted because they've been focusing on Verity Baptist Church so much. So they just go through and they try to find anybody that's associated with them to try to pit everybody against them. I said that earlier. That's their, their means. That's how they try to do it. Someone, some, some moron put uh, on change.org, they made a petition to remove Pastor Jimenez as the, as the pastor of that church with like the American Baptist or something. They're independent Baptists. They have no authority over them. Good luck. You know, you're wasting all your time making these stupid positions. You don't understand anything about the church. You're not going to oust him as pastor. Right. Because guess what? The people of that church believe the same thing. Right. It's not like all of a sudden he came out with this and everyone's like, oh, I can't believe pastor just said that. And they're all going to like, we can't have this guy or pastor. No. No. They're fools. And so they contacted me and they're asking, you know, I see you're going to this preaching conference. Do you know that he's, do you agree with what he said on this? Well, I got news for you. It's called the Red Hot Preaching Conference. This is not the Joel Osteen Conference. This is not the Joyce Meyer Conference. This is not the watered down, let's all love and feel good conference. It's called Red Hot because we preach hellfire and damnation unto the lost and, and unto the saved that people could fear the Lord and keep His commandments. It's red hot and fiery for a reason. Yes, I know He preaches that. And yes, I believe it too. Amen. And everybody that's going to this event believes the same thing. So go ahead and protest this all you want. We're still going to do it and you can't shut us up. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your great words of wisdom. God, I pray that you would please bless every congregant here. Help us all, Lord, to, to love your, your commandments and your laws, dear Lord, and to keep them and to do them, dear Lord, and that we would not be ashamed and we would not back down to these God-haters that are trying to stop 
the, the, the gospel from going out and trying to stop your word from being preached, dear Lord. We're not going to have it. We ought to be God rather than men. We're not going to be scared of their phases. We're not going to be scared of the things they can do. We're going to fear you, dear Lord, who's able to cast both soul and body in hell. We're not going to fear what man can do unto us, dear Lord. When we pray that you would please strengthen us, give us the boldness, give us the wisdom of speech, dear Lord. Give, I pray for your protection. On, uh, we know that these people are vile. They're full of all wickedness. They're full of murder, dear Lord. And we pray that you would please protect us and build a hedge about us and all the other men of God and all the other churches that are standing in these last days for you, dear Lord, that you would protect us and that you would guide us and lead the way, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.